All right, here we are. I think this is week, what is it, 13 um, of the conference. And we've got a great, great panel this uh, this week with uh, Gina and Zach and Carolyn um, talking about how nutrient density is, um, <clears throat> you know, looked at in the supply chain. Um, so I'm not going to attempt to presume that I know where they're going to go with this conversation. I'm really much looking forward to it. And uh, I think Gina, Gina gets to go first. So we'll jump in. And as usual, people uh, put your questions in the Q&A. Feel free to chat in the chat box. And we'll have a um, rollicking conversation starting in an hour. But right now, look forward to some great presentations. All right, take it away, Gina. All right, thanks, Dan. So I am Gina Nagel. I am the co-founder of Public Good Provisions with Zach Angelini, who's here with me today. Um, Public Good Provisions, our mission is to build regenerative, regionalized, efficiently scaled supply chains for food and fiber in service of the public good. And before starting Public Good Provisions with Zach, I was the vice president of Mission and Regenerative Agriculture at Applegate, and Applegate is the nation's leading brand of antibiotic-free and organic and now regenerative meat in the United States. And um, while I was there, I laid the foundation for our the company's regenerative strategy. So the first time I ever even heard the term regenerative agriculture was in 2012, and I was absolutely moved by the idea that meat could be good for the planet and that there and you know that animals could um be these magnificent tools for regeneration and i thought it was an, such an amazing story for applegate to be able to tell and i started to plant the seeds there in 2012 and then build that strategy until finally leaving the company in 2023 but um, Carolyn, who's on the call today, is my predecessor at Applegate. And we're still working, Zach and I, with Carolyn, because um, something I can that we want to bring home today is that system change is requires a long view. It takes a long time and it cre and it also takes unprecedented collaboration. So you know, in terms of time, I can tell you, you know, starting this in 2012 and not releasing really our first nationally launched product product at Applegate, Applegate until 2022. So it took a long time. And then now Carolyn is obviously building on this work because again, a long view is required. You know, we can't stop something and then, you know, um, reinvent what we were already doing. Carolyn is really taking that work forward. And Zachary, I met while I was at Applegate when we were sourcing meat for our new regenerative hot dog. And he was leading sustainability at Timberland at the time. And we realized that we could collaborate on hides and meat and more efficiently scale these supply chains. So again, a level of collaboration that was unprecedented for us at the time. So um, we're all three here today to talk about systems change from a market perspective, and I will let Carolyn take it from here and introduce herself. Thanks, Gina. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having us today. We're really excited to be here. Thank you, Dan, for um, creating this great uh, hub for this discussion to happen. Um, as Gina mentioned, I couldn't be more thrilled to uh, take the reins of the Applegate's mission work um, based on the foundation that she laid um, and to continue to still work together with her and Zach and have this systems view approach that's, you know, across industry uh, beyond food. And we're going to talk more about that today. But uh, my background before this um, I was working with Aramark, which is a food service provider within supply chain. Um, and my role was to integrate local farms and local businesses into institutional dining programs. Um, so universities, hospitals, um, big institutions, 
uh, and large supply chains. Um, and so really taking a systems view approach of how to plug in something different into that big model and um, finding the infrastructure components that can serve the the smaller farm or the smaller business in addition to the larger businesses that they're serving. So really it's, to me, I take a systems approach to things, look at, um, look at the food system as a puzzle, look at, um, you know, what barriers exist to make something scale. And we can apply that to the topic we'll be talking about today and regenerative agriculture and nutrient density. Um, I, before Aramark real quickly, I'll just mention that I started as a farmer myself. Um, I uh, am a first generation farmer, really came to agriculture uh, from my own personal desire to learn about something that I felt like I was deprived of as growing up. I didn't have an education around agriculture or food. And so really I had sort of a life change in you know my 20s and uh, learned farming. Um, there's always more to learn, but um, really uh, got a pretty holistic view of organic vegetable and meat production. Um, and from there kind of launched into my own, uh, farm business and, um, really with a local community farming sort of mindset throughout that process. And I'll pass it to Zach to give a proper intro. Awesome. Thank you, Carolyn. And um, yeah, just echoing the excitement to be here and be part of this conversation. Uh, I'm learning a ton about nutrient density from Carolyn, Gina, and Dan. Um, like Gina mentioned, my background is in the apparel industry. I formerly led global sustainability for Timberland and um, in that role was tasked with helping Timberland understand their overarching environmental impacts, what aspects of their business were creating the largest environmental impacts and how to reduce those. Um, and in that work, we really identified um, that within Timberland supply chain, the agricultural phase of production was where the majority of their impacts were coming from. Um, and that's because the majority of Timberland's kind of top volume materials that go into their boots and clothing are mostly natural materials. So it's like leather, cotton, natural rubber, um, and, and a few other wool, a few other materials. Um, and so as we started to identify regenerative agriculture as a major lever to address the impact of those materials, we really started to learn, like Gina mentioned, that the apparel industry and the food industry's supply chains overlap in a major way. And so there's a major opportunity for those two industries to come together and drive this collaborative systems change um, that Gina was talking about. So yeah, really excited to um, be a part of this conversation that kind of Intersection and collaboration is how Gina, Carolyn, Dan, and I all met. And um, yeah, excited to share how we're taking all this work forward. Maybe I will hand back to Gina now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the most powerful forces that we have for creating systems change is consumer demand. And I think a phenomenal example of this is the organic industry which last year reached $60 billion. And when you think about that, that, and you know, obviously Carolyn and I are both coming from this antibiotic free meat world and sort you see the same thing there. You know, these changes, these dramatic shifts that we see in the food system are con mostly consumer driven, right? So there's no, um, policy that mandates, for example, that companies remove antibiotics from their system. And there's no real research out there that definitively says that, you know, organic food is better than conventional food, but yet we see this growth in the market. So I think overall, from, you know, my perspective, there's just a visceral understanding with consumers when they know about these things to to, you know, they just they just viscerally have a repulsion to chemicals and things like that in their food and really are supportive deep down of natural systems. So, um, yeah, this to me is just, you know, an unbelievable number. And 
one of the most powerful ways to drive that demand is through brands, right? Through brands and their marketing and their creation of products, you know, can be great drivers. And I saw for myself, I came to Applegate in 2006. And at the time, there was only really a handful of companies selling antibiotic free meat. But we did significant marketing. We often did marketing together and uh, really grassroots going around the country, um, you know, educating people. Um, this is one of our finer examples of the power of marketing, our cleaner wiener campaign. And that's the beauty of brands is that, you know, the ability to be fun and approachable, um, this is like educating without people realizing they're being educated. And we always use our hot dog as our ambassador product. So it's always been sort of this analogous with how we were thinking about our supply chains. So at first our hot dogs were antibiotic free, then they were organic and grass fed, and now moving into regenerative. So um, yeah, the cleaner wiener tour, fun times. <laughs> Uh, another thing we did was create it, a doc documentary film about resistance, and it really provided the context for the misuse of antibiotics in animal agriculture. So it explained how did we get here? Why do we use antibiotics? And what is the, and most importantly, what is the impact on human health? And we did screenings of this film all over the country. And um, some Netflix executives showed up at a couple of our screenings and saw the interest around this topic. And then they ended up distributing the film on Netflix and translating it into nine languages. So a lot of times when we're talking about systems change or thinking about systems change, it can become overwhelming because we think, my God, we have to get every person to understand and how are we possibly going to do that? And something I really love is this concept of the law of diffusion of innovation, because it's kind of, it can kind of put you at ease because you look at it and it's like, we don't need to get everyone to understand something. We need to get enough people to understand it that we create a tipping point and then that idea goes mainstream. So really, you know, according to the theory, we need 9% of the early adopters and, you know, 7% of the next level up. So we don't need to finally, you know, just create this tipping point where you're no longer pushing a boulder up a hill and an idea really takes hold. So if you want to go to the next one. So I feel as though I had a front row seat at Applegate to the tipping point that happened for antibiotic free meat. And I remember it was around 2008. It was at this very time that the founder of Applegate was getting frustrated that consumers were not understanding really the connection between the misuse of antibiotics in animal agriculture and the connection or the impact that it can have on human health. So he hired a very expensive, a polling company in DC to do a big report and assess consumers' understanding of this concept and were they making the connection. And after a lot of time and money, this agency came back and said, you know what? We don't think that any time in the near future, people are going to understand consumers will ever make this connection. And it was really depressing to hear that at that time because we had already spent, Applegate was already in business for 20 years by that point, pushing that boulder up a hill, trying to educate people about this difference. And here's this agency saying that they don't see that, uh, that understanding ever happening in the near future. And it was just at that time, it was a 2008, that the Pew Foundation came out with their report on antibiotics and really talking about the impact that it was having this resistant bacteria on human health. And it was groundbreaking. Um, and we had Katie Couric heard about the report, um, read the report and was so 
startled that this was not something that was on the front page of every newspaper in America, that she took it upon herself to do a three-part series on the CBS Evening News. And it wasn't long after that, that Consumer Reports came out with a big report talking about meat on drugs and really bringing to the mainstream market this connection between what was happening in agriculture and the impact that that was having on human health. And I can tell you, I mean, I could feel the shift happening. So like, think about it. The Pew Report came out in 2018 and in 2015, Applegate was purchased by Hormel Foods. And in that same year, um, Purdue purchased Nyman Ranch. And that was because we were these, the leading antibiotic free meat companies. And these conventional companies saw that that's where the market was going. And it was cheaper for them to purchase companies, even at almost a billion dollars, than it was to, for them to kind of reinvent their entire supply chains. So you saw at that time, a number of these companies being purchased by conventional companies as an indicator that this is where the market is going. And again, completely consumer driven. Now, we were talking about this for many, 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 many years before 2008, right? So like, why did this all of a sudden take hold? And in my mind, it was because by that time, there was already enough people that have had, that either had a personal experience or knew someone that had an experience of antibiotics not working and resistance being there. And especially with parents of children that they were seeing that, you know, for example, ear infections, their kids were getting one ear infection after another and antibiotics weren't working and they saw that resistance can build. And there was just this understanding so that when the message landed, it really took hold. So that to me was an exciting thing to see. And I think that this tipping point is going to come faster, much faster for regenerative agriculture, because we already have so much going on in the, you know, in the mainstream market right now, where people are talking about this, writing about it, making commitments to regenerative agriculture. We didn't see any of that with organic or antibiotic freight. The next slide. So, so that, I'll hop in here. Um, yeah, so we know in physics, the tipping point is when the balance is tipped with a small amount of weight. So if you add a feather to a balanced seesaw, it might be enough to tip it over to the other side. You have water building up in a cloud until it finally drops out as rain. In sociology, it's the critical mass, the boiling point, or you know, like the point of no return when a movement takes hold and makes that shift. Uh, if you guys have read Malcolm Gladwell's book, he uh, called the tipping point how little things can make a big difference. Uh, you might remember he describes three agents of change for a tipping point, and uh, the first is the law of the few, uh, where he says that success is dependent on the few who have the wide social networks. So basically 80% of the work or the message um, in this case will be spread by 20% of the people. These people are well-connected, they're leaders, they are persuasive, they're negotiators, and they are information experts. The second law is the stickiness factor. How memorable is the message? Is it easily understood? Um, are you speaking to the right people? And the third is the power of context. Is this the right time? You know, we hear things like, oh, that was before it's time. You know, it has to be the right time in the moment in history to really make that tipping point happen. Uh, and we see this all the time in a social context. We see revolutions that results in the overthrowing of a government. Just this week, this happened in Bangladesh. Um, we see companies going out of business, you know, companies, their finances might be um, on, on the decline for a little while, but it's a certain tipping point that results in them actually going out of business. Um, and um, we see viral videos all, all the time. And that's interesting because it actually has an algorithm for that tipping point. Um, with economics, the tipping point is reliant on many factors coalescing at the same time, the supply, the demand, 
and that social adoption. So a good analogy here is the electric vehicle market. There needs to be a complete ecosystem that exists to support that shift to EVs before the tipping point can really take hold. And that ecosystem would include the car parts, the car manufacturing infrastructure, the charging stations and infrastructure for making the batteries. Um, these all have to be at scale before that adoption can really happen. And um, so as a society, we often know what needs to shift and change before the economic markets really show that. Um, climate change is a good example. You know, we all know what needs to happen, but it takes a while for things to get moving. And that's because the ecosystem for each individual solution is not fully developed to create that tipping point. So it's the same thing for regenerative agriculture. We, all of us working in this space know there's a better way to do agriculture than what's happening uh, um, in, in the mainstream. But the ecosystem and the e infrastructure does not yet uh, support a viable economic model for regenerative agriculture. And so in order for this to happen, both the supply and demand need to be stimulated. So they're growing together, which in order for those to be stimulated more quickly, there would be some artificial mechanism in place like grant funding or financial incentives to control price points. And at that point, then the social message can go viral where the influencers can influence, the salesmen can sell, and then we have human behavior shift. Next slide. So one of the crazy things we have access to now with Google and social media is a visual into people's thoughts and conversations. So we can gauge social trends through what Google searches people are doing or what hashtags they're using on social media. This feels a little voyeuristic and icky, but nonetheless, um, the graph on the top left shows the social media chatter about regenerative agriculture through 2023. It's kind of small. I don't know if you guys can see this, but um, you can see 2023 there um, when the squiggly line stops. And um, then the, the beyond that to the right of that is an estimation for the next 10 years based on similar trends that have happened in food um, like organic or antibiotic free. Um, and so the bottom right graph is that same thing, but in sales, if you were to estimate the sales that would result from that, you can see where we're at right now is basically the cusp of this tipping point. Um, regenerative ag in sales last year or 2022 represented $21 million food and beverage. Um, the estimations by 2032 would be 11.5 billion using these um, algorithms. And that would follow the adoption rate of other comparable claims. But one difference that makes regen different from other trends is that, you know, it spans beyond food and products into other industries, because really it's viewed as a climate solution that can draw down carbon, rebuild soil, and it's positioned as many things, um, like a way to alleviate risk in the supply chain, reduce the community impacts of climate change, provide healthier food for people. So it's, it's being talked about not just on social media, but also in the boardrooms of major corporations and governments. Um, we, you know, love like some of the, co the companies that have this in their mantras. Um, the folks at McCain, um, potatoes, if you aren't familiar, super cool people, uh, they say regenerative ag is not a trend, it's a life raft. And uh, American Farmland Trust is coined No Soil, No Food, popular bumper sticker that you might see if you live in the US. Um, so commitments around regenerative ag are being viewed as a way to future proof the business, and they're really tied to business strategy. Next slide. Back to Gia. Yeah, so more in terms of social proof, uh, this is something that you know we didn't see in the antibiotic free or organic movements where mainstream magazines were writing about the topics. So, but we're already seeing 
um, this connection between soil health or the soil microbiome and the human microbiome. And this is in mainstream magazines like Eating Well. Um, one of the biggest influencers is Joe Rogan. Um, if you can look at these numbers, 18 million followers on Instagram. Um, his podcast has 190 million downloads every month. I mean, these are ex ungodly exceptional numbers. And he is the sort of unofficial spokesperson on regenerative agriculture. He's had farmers on his show like Joel Salatin, and Will Harris, and he's really educating people about the importance of regenerative agriculture and its connection to human health. And just as a demonstration that, you know, the market seems to be so much more ahead of what Carolyn was talking about, the infrastructure and the back end of things. I mean, here's somebody with this enormous following, and there is no regenerative brand that is even you know, sponsoring this show or doing ads on this show, which is unheard of because anybody with this sort of following, you know, brands would be beating the door down to get their messages and their products mentioned on commercials or whatnot. So um, again, just, just more indication that there's a consciousness out there for regenerative agriculture. Uh, we have a few recent films that have come out um, around regenerative agriculture that really work to create the social proof needed um, that use celebrities to push regenerative agriculture. And those celebrities use their own social networks and reputation to amplify a message that's important to them personally. And so the formula of these films uses a firsthand account, which would be a farmer um, using the farmer's story to present the facts of um, a different way to do agriculture. And then we have recognizable celebrity voices to confirm, validate the information and appeal to the emotions of the viewer. And going back to the tipping point uh, conversation, that's the stickiness factor. Um, and the cool thing about this movement and these films is that we are putting farmers at the center of the message, knowing that the change happens on the land and farmers are the ones making that change. And when we have influential farmers uh, telling their story, it can persuade other farmers to adopt new practices and advocate for what they're doing. Um, hearing how this has worked for other farmers is often the only way other farmers can be convinced. I'm sure you guys are familiar with how farmers operate. This is sort of another layer to peel back of this onion. When we think about driving change, that farmers are a tough bunch to persuade. And that's with good reason, because the changes that we're asking them to do cost money. They, there's upfront costs. Um, and we're asking them to invest in something now that may not have a return for another 10 years. And so this leads to us, you know, really thinking deeply about how we are financing these changes. Um, but nonetheless, we have the social proof to get these changes, um, incentivize these changes uh, from the larger population. Next slide. Yeah, so just another bit of social proof that we wanted to touch on here is that the regenerative agriculture, the topic of regenerative agriculture is really taking off in the fashion industry as well. Um, so this picture here is from a large marketing campaign that um, UGG did, which is a brand owned by Deckers. They have a whole product line using regenerative sheepskin from land to market verified farms. In addition to that, Timberland, the company that I came from, and its sister companies, the North Face, Vans, and Smartwall, um, have all invested really heavily into the regenerative space and all have products out there in the market today and are talking about those products. Um, so it's taking off in these lifestyle and outdoor apparel spaces, but then also we're seeing it really start to take off in the luxury space as well, which we know is a, a highly influential space when it comes to culture. So Caring, which is the parent company of many luxury fashion brands like Gucci, Balenciaga, Alexander McQueen, um, 
they are working on shifting their supply chain towards regenerative agriculture. And they've actually set up what's called a regenerative fund for nature that's investing $5 million a year into scaling regenerative ag. Um, in addition to that, we also see Vogue magazine writing many articles on the topic. All of this really just showing that it's not just a niche topic for some small clothing brands, but it's really being talked about and invested in um, by some major mainstream brands, which means that consumers are going to be hearing and learning about regenerative agriculture and the importance of it from multiple touch points in their lives. So whether it's the clothes they wear um, or the food that they eat. So while we know that fiber crops um, for clothing make up a smaller percentage of agricultural lands than food crops, we also know that fashion companies have this outsized influence on culture and what mainstream consumers think about. So we think this is really a significant proof point and in, um, in that fashion has the significant influence on consumer awareness. And so this next slide here, um, is really just, I, I think kind of says it all. It's the Google search results on regenerative agriculture um, showing how often that term has been mentioned or searched in, in the Google database. Um, and you can see that in a relatively short period of time, it went from zero to really significant numbers. Um, and so we think there's many converging factors that led to this, like the ones that we mentioned, but um, several others that probably folks in, in this call could think of too. Um, I think overall, like, I, something that is really exciting to me is just hearing Gina's firsthand account of seeing this tipping point happen for antibiotic free and in hearing from her that she also had these moments and feelings of, oh my God, this is never going to happen. It's, it's too big of a change. It's too complicated for consumers to understand how are we going to get there? And then seeing that tipping point happen um, and then hearing from Carolyn kind of like the formula for how those tipping points happen, I think it's so exciting to just think about because being in the industry, I'm sure we've all had those feelings of like, how is regenerative agriculture ever going to take hold? How is kind of how are consumers going to be oh, become aware of nutrient density and really demand that we shift away from these kind of conventional industrial agricultural practices? So it's, I think, just really motivating to think like, OK, when we have those feelings, we could be much closer to a tipping point than we actually realize. And, and we see that those, those tipping points, um, things can just kind of change like that. So we know the social proof is there and bubbling. And we as Applegate have learned as a mission based brand that oftentimes you have to just put something in front of the consumers in order for them to know they want it. So in other words, we know that brands can create the demand to drive the change we want to see rather than wait for consumers to create that demand. So we tested the market on this with our first regenerative product, the Do Good Dog Hot Dog. And this came out in 2021, um, made exclusively with regeneratively raised beef. Um, and we created a separate product that could go on the shelf. And um, so next to our existing SKUs of hot dogs, uh, we had Do Good Dog. And this, is, this had a great story. We worked with a farmer in North Carolina who could tell you know, his story, show that you know, story of the land and how the soil benefits from the movement of the animals. In our messaging, we talked about soil health, biodiversity, carbon sequestration, water retention. And the goal was to empower consumers with their food choices, that they can do good to the planet by buying a hot dog. You know, powerful stuff, powerful message. Uh, we learned a ton from this experience. The big one being that no matter how important the topic is, if consumers can't make the connection between that bigger picture and their own personal life, the message will fall flat. And, you know, we all have to remember that the everyday consumer knows very little about how food is grown. So they're not really aware outside of the mainstream topics like the higher level, uh, you know, animal welfare, organic, um, that they aren't aware of the problems that exist within agriculture. So, for example, we talk about soil health and keeping the soil covered. Consumers for the most part, don't realize that leaving ground bare for the entire winter after a corn harvest, they don't see how that, they don't understand why that's problematic. 
Um, and so, you know, long story short, we launched this product with regen messaging, fell a little flat with consumers. So what did we do? Well, we threw in the towel. We actually said, we're tired. This, we, we tried it, didn't work. No one wants regen. Nope, just kidding. We said, <laughs> you know what? No one wants this. We have to make them want it. So we decided to transition all of the beef used in all of our hot dogs to certified regenerative beef. Um, this transition is going to be complete by the end of 2025 and will contribute to over 6 million acres of grassland transitioning to regenerative. Um, and, you know, at that point, we won't have a separate hot dog item. It'll just be in the pro our normal products, right? So we aren't asking consumers to change what they were buying to buy regen. Um, and we know we're just a little bit ahead of that tipping point and that supply demand ecosystem is not fully developed to support the larger transition. And so our goal as a brand that does purchase in volume is to bring the supply of regen beef to scale and help push that over the edge, help create supply that can be then be available in larger volumes for bigger companies. Um, and like I mentioned this way, we aren't asking consumers to decide between the normal Applegate hot dogs that they're used to and the regen hot dogs, which we've learned through this process that some people think the word regenerative means fake meat. Um, so we just decided it's easier if we make the choice for them in this case. Next slide. So when, and one of the plus slides, sides of regenerative agriculture being this big complex topic means that it touches a lot of different audiences. So we have farmers looking to increase profitability on their land. We have businesses looking to reduce the risk in their supply chain. We have climate scientists calculating solutions. Um, and we have, you know, bird watchers wanting to watch to spot native species on their land. There's really something for everyone with Regen Ag. And so the message can be tailored appropriately to reach those different groups. All that buzz and chatter in the different groups contributes overall to building the bigger critical mass. Um, and, you know, the bird example, na the National Audubon Society has around 2 million members across the U.S. who are interested, um, who could be interested in regenerative products if they knew that regenerative agriculture contributes to um, increasing the amount of bird species that are on the land. Um, and so most relevant to our discussion today is the consumer audience and the group everybody's a part of. We are all a part of it on this call. Um, and as consumers, many of us are looking for the tastiest, the crunchiest, juiciest, highest quality, nutrient-rich food that we can get. And if you had a choice between food that had a lower amount or a higher amount of nutrients that are critical to our health, had properties that could help you look younger, help you lose weight, help you avoid developing chronic diseases, which one would you choose? Lower nutrients or higher nutrients? So as a mission-based food brand, we are super excited about the potential for nutrient density to be that that linchpin in the home to you know house all the benefits of regenerative agriculture under this focus message about what it means for human health and we when we can show that regeneratively raised food has higher nutrient density than conventionally raised foods it's just proof that all of it works um, and so it will drive demand justify price premiums and give the power of choice and personal health back to the consumer. So, you know, really super jazzed about all of the work uh, BFA is doing to catalog the nutrient density of foods, conduct studies that compare conventional versus regenerative food, you know, production systems, and really create that database of baselines. So we have more complete information to use as a brand for product labels and to really like let consumers know what actually is in their food. Technology like the spectrometer um, for measuring nutrient density, very promising because it, you know, really empowers consumers um, and alleviates that greenwashing risk um, because 
consumers can see it with their own eyes. Um, we, you know, nutrient density doesn't come from small incremental changes. You know, we're really going to see this when uh, we see the drastic systems change. And that's a huge shift. You know, this, the microbiology in the soil needs to be different um, for that new system, you know, where we have go from dead soil to living soil. Um, but, you know, so it's not going to happen overnight, but, you know, the concept really needs to get into consumers' minds now so they can get educated on how their food was grown. Like I mentioned, average person just isn't familiar with most, most of that process. Um, and so they need to be able to understand what the problem is today so that they know nutrient density is the solution to that problem. Next slide. Awesome. So yeah, like Carolyn said, in order to achieve this true change in nutrient density outcomes and everything that we've learned in these past um, sessions of this conference, we need true systems change to, to achieve that. Um, and so we know that you can't build new a new food and fiber system with the mindset that we use to build the old one, um, which is why we love this statement here, which comes from a research article reviewing the work of E.O. Wilson and Charles Darwin. So we all probably know the Darwin quote, survival of the fittest. Um, but if you look at the broader context of Darwin's work, you actually find that while he did say survival of the fittest, he goes on to define the fittest as those species with the greatest capacity to cooperate, stating that cooperation has actually been more important than competition in humanity's evolutionary success. And so we believe that in order to create true system change and build regenerative supply chains that support regenerative farms, we need to apply this mindset of unprecedented cross-industry and cross-disciplinary collaboration. Um, and so really for regenerative agriculture and nutrient density to become the norm and to meet this tipping point of consumer demand, we know that we have to out collaborate its conventional counterpart so that we can deliver these more nutrient dense products at scale um, and at a price point that consumers can afford. Um, and the great thing is that the regenerative livestock industry really lends itself to collaboration. So we know we have all the different parts of the animals that can go into a variety of industries, including food, fashion, beauty, pet, many others. Um, and this means that all of those different industries that normally don't interact with each other can actually come together, support farms in their regenerative transition um, and really help usher in this, this new system. Um, and that's like we mentioned at the beginning, this is actually how Gina and I met each other was setting up a collaborative partnership between Applegate and Timberland to co-source the regenerative leather for Timberland boots together along with regenerative beef for Applegate hot dogs. Um, and in doing so, it enabled us to cost share the premiums on those materials, get more value back to farmers for all parts of that regeneratively raised animal. It allowed us to align our sourcing requirements so that we were not asking farmers for slightly different certifications and verification and documentation and really reduce that burden on farmers. It also allowed us to co-invest in shared marketing to tell interesting stories of why is a boot brand and a meat company working together and get that word out to consumers um, and a whole host of other just kind of shared benefits when we, we collaborated on that work rather than going about that work separately as our individual companies, which is for the most part what's happening today. Um, and so we know that this collaboration is really critical to achieving efficiency through full carcass utilization when we think about um, livestock only operations, but this also applies to whole farm utilization. So when we talk about diversified systems, which we know that kind of diversified crops and animals is necessary to achieve diverse microbiology, which is necessary to achieve nutrient density. Um, we know that the beauty of that is that this diverse production type of system really lends itself to collaboration amongst diverse sets of brands. So the more diverse set of crops and animals being grown on one farm just means that a more diverse set of end industries and brands can support that same farm and then offtake different materials in the end, not competing over the end product. 
Um, so really activating these like win-win scenarios to help scale regenerative agriculture. Um, and so this is why both Applegate and Public Good Provisions are aiming to build what we're calling regenerative buying coalitions. Um, so we know that diversified supply needs to be supported by diversified demand. So if we want farmers to add different crops to their rotation or system, we know that there needs to be end customers for that and supporting that transition. Um, so we really believe that these regenerative buying coalitions are necessary for achieving efficiency and driving the systems change that we keep talking about by spreading the risks and costs associated with transition to regenerative systems. Um, and so that leads to kind of the vision of public good provisions, which Gina mentioned before, but just to, to emphasize that here, it's really to design hyper collaborative regionalized regenerative food and fiber systems that are built in service of the public good. Um, and we do this today in our work by consulting with food and fashion brands on the regenerative sourcing strategies with the ultimate goal of building these cross industry regenerative buying coalitions, as well as empowering new narratives on the possibilities of regeneration. So we know that in order to build, um, and we're doing that in order to build consumer demand while facilitating the necessary cross-industry collaboration to deliver on that demand. Um, and we're super excited and grateful to partner with Applegate as part of their commitment to drive true systems change um, in animal agriculture, and, and as a result, hopefully result in um, true nutrient density outcomes. Uh, yeah, so with that, I will hand it back to Gina to wrap us up. Yes, so uh, a new food system requires new stories. And right now, the narrative around climate and the current system is one of scarcity and what we like to call disaster porn. It's all about what's wrong with the world. Uh, don't do this or you're going to die. You know, and it you we can't scare people into caring. You know, we need to create stories that are more hopeful. Um, something I like to you know, say all the time is we need stories that start to paint the picture of what the world would look like without these things, without climate change. And how can we create a vision for the world that is so astoundingly beautiful that people will do whatever it takes to make it real? You know, we don't respond to desperate, horrifying stories. I always bring up this example of Martin Luther King, you know, how did he get 250,000 people to show up in DC before television was even widespread? It wasn't, you know, I have a strategy, but I have a dream. And he was able to paint a picture that was so clear and so beautiful that people could begin to see themselves as part of it. And that's what has to happen here. I also think that there needs to be a new narrative around abundance when we're talking about these new regenerative systems. There's something, you know, I think in um, the ethos that if you move to sustainability or to more sustainable systems or to regenerative systems or, you know, systems that are better for the environment, that you're somehow going to be sacrificing something. You know, you're going to be in, in terms of food, you're going to be sacrificing flavor or quality. And, you know, in terms of fashion, you're going to be sacrificing aesthetic or good design. And this is why this quote by Charles Eisenstein really, really hits. And it's been a guiding principle for us in our forming, Zach and I, of forming uh, public good provisions. And it is, I disagree with the environmentalist idea that we're going to have to make do with less. In reality, we're going to have to do make do with more, more beauty, more community, more fulfillment, more art, more music, and more material objects that are fewer in number, but richer in aesthetics. This is the story that we have to start telling. And even as part of that, inviting different, more diverse voices to the table. You know, when you think about artists and designers and innovators they are that is their job is to create to paint pictures of new worlds to create new worlds these folks need to be at the table with us 
as we start to create these new stories and and these new supply chains. It's important for designers to be connected to the supply chains that they're designing from, because if they understood how the products they created impacted and you know made this kind of agriculture prosper, they'd be more likely to incorporate those materials in the products that they design. So uh, this is something also that we're really excited about at Public Good Provisions is making this connection between artists and creatives and, you know, and system change. So um, I'd like to thank everyone here for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Carolyn and Zach. Uh, and if there's anything else that you want to add, but we really appreciate being able to um, tell the story from a market perspective and also how Applegate and public good provisions, you know, taking this work in regenerative to the next level and, you know, working together to do that. All right. And Carolyn, Zach, you guys want to have any final uh, <laughs> comments before we start the Q&A or leave it, leave it there? That was Gina's. Let's, let's <laughs> leave it there. Final words yeah. from Gina are always good. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah, yeah. beautiful. <laughs> <clears throat> Great. All right. Um, if you want to turn off your this, the um, slide, Zach, we can, we can all see each other in slightly larger, larger faces. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Great presentation. Um, this is always one of those real questions. It's like, I guess I've been part of the early adopter world and the organic movement and things like that and nutrient density. But yeah, you see, you see the truth and the vision, but then there's, you know, the process of getting it to, to the tipping point and Malcolm Gladwell's work is all deeply part of this conversation. Um, before I, I, I've got a, a number of questions here, but before I start with them, Erwin, any, any comments from as a, as a farmer? Or... Uh, yes, as a farmer, of course, then <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I'm not as, that busy in, in selling my goods because I sell most of it to seed companies and I have a really close contact with it. But I think this work is uh, really important that you guys do. Uh, but I'm wondering, um, do you focus more on like the process certification like we do with organics or more at the end product certification like they do at Blue Blank Coeur, which means that if you don't need, need uh, achieve a certain nutrient level that your product can be certified. And secondly, I'd like to know what the uh, role of um, a meter for consumer um, choice awareness can play. What your vision is on that? Who wants to go first? Uh, I can take the first. The first part of that question, I think I understand to be sort of a practices versus outcomes question yeah. is that accurate um yeah so for applegate um we we focus on outcomes right and so this is how we've approached animal welfare um you know and things like like demanding no antibiotics ever is is technically a practice but it results in the outcomes we're looking to see as far as overall system health um, in, in our system. Um, and so we, you know, that's our goal is to, to focus on outcomes. We're measuring particulars with animal welfare. Um, and so if we're less concerned about, you know, exactly all the practices that are used to get there and more about the, the outcomes itself, um, because sometimes practices, they're not cookie cutter and sometimes they don't work for particular farms or suppliers that um, results in bad outcomes. And so pushing practices isn't, isn't necessarily going to work for everybody. Um, yeah. When it comes to regenerative agriculture, um, this is a tough one because um, <laughs> I know this is at the heart of, of the, you know, sort of a debate within regenerative agriculture. Um, and it's the, sort of the same thing. I mean, we are focused on outcomes and every piece of land is different. And so, you know, demanding the same practices across all that, you know, the different, the needs are different. And so, you know, we don't want to, as a company, we also aren't the experts of the land, right? That's the farmer's job. 
And so we don't, we don't want to be in a position to say you have to do, um, you know, this on your farm, even if the farmer says, well, I don't need that because I'm achieving these outcomes. And so that's where we would like to get. Um, but I think there's still some, you know, some measurement tools that maybe need to be in place for regenerative um, to measure those outcomes so that we can say, you know, we are achieving what what we said we would achieve with biodiversity or water quality, um, th things like that. And Zach might have some insights from textile exchange work on that topic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, can I um, comment on this? Yes. Please first, because um, as, as I learned from the conference uh, from Stefan from Fleet's presentation that uh, I think in animals, it is um, re regenerative practices, and I don't want to overstate it, but I think it is more clear that regenerative practices with a, a feed biodiversity uh, meadow and so on, and regenerative grazing lead to uh, nutrient denser or with higher nutrient values of omega-3 to omega-6 in the animal products. And mm -hmm. as I learned from Dan's presentation at the first uh, one, that for the... Um, fruits and vegetables, it is a lot harder uh, to link certain practices directly to uh, what is an outcome in the produce. And for me as a farmer, it is hard. On the one hand, I think it is for the consumer the most fair that he or she only pays for uh, produce that has this certain amount of nutrients to be certified. But on the other hand, as a farmer, I know how hard it is to keep a constant quality and you know also in the search to what practices really lead to high nutrient values we are, we are not there yet by a long shot really by a long shot mm -hmm. so you need to stimulate these farmers with this uh, different market that appreciates their value of uh, efforts that they spend in building this regenerative agriculture system at the farm and if you'd say you only get your your premium if you get your vitamin C up to 100 milligrams or something like that, you know they, they, they might get there in 10 years and they, they can yeah. can't have that. So uh, I, I have yeah I'm a little bit too sided yeah. with that. Yeah, from, and, from the farmer side. Yeah, and the land that needs regenerative practices the most is the one that's going to be currently the least nutrient dense and so the farmer who takes on that challenge of regenerating that land is going to be at a disadvantage if he's incentivized with payments of around you know nutrient dense food that comes off of the land and so there does need to be something else that is incentivizing the farmer as the steward of the of this land that is helping all of us be healthier when the land is healthier um, needs to get credit for that work that they've done to make the land better. Yeah, but you don't only want to uh, credit the effort. You, in the end, you also want to credit the end result. Exactly, that's yeah. A, that's, a, yeah. That's a hard balance. <laughs> but okay, that's, how about the meter then? <laughs> the meter help. <laughs> that's the vision of the meter. But I think, I mean, uh, to reference the previous presentations of this conference, I think what David Knaus was talking about last week and John Kemp a couple of weeks before that, you know, and and Ken Hamilton early on, you know, in different, and and you guys, I mean, Dimar, we we, I think actually do know a lot that can be, um, implemented in a fairly in a fairly, I don't say cookie cutter, but but you know, replicable fashion. Um, and I think you know, my argument has always been as a farmer, I don't need to sell for a premium because my cost of production is lower. So. That I think, I mean, it, it, <laughs> I think economics really do matter in almost all these pieces of this equation, and it's got to be better economics. Um, I mean, I think you know we talked during the presentation earlier about you know maybe some grant money or 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 sort of stuff like that happening, and and sort of, but the vision is that this actually is less expensive, right? It, you your fertilizer costs are lower, your your animal deaths are lower, your insecticide press, you know, costs are lower. And so that that correlates dramatically with economic viability for the farmer. I think that's got to be where it gets to. But <clears throat> yeah, it's a dance and we're in the process. <laughs> so yeah, why don't you, why do you need a premium then now, yeah. right? Yeah, and I guess the idea would be that we are going to be, this results in a more diverse 
uh, market for a lot of different crops that aren't currently on the market. And so when we think about like grain production right now, it's really just corn and soy um, in the U.S. And if we are, you know, really focused on nutrient density and soil health, um, that's going to result in a lot of other grains on the market that um, would have different price points than corn and soy. So the idea there would be the farmers do get paid, you know, the right price for the things that they're growing to cover their cost of production. Yeah. And, and you had a question, I think, for the panel about what the, the potential role of a meter be. Um, I'd love to hear their comments. I'm obviously a big advocate of it, but how do you guys see that driving or affecting this law of the few and the ease of understanding the message and all that kind of stuff? Um, I don't know. Gina, Gina do you, you have... want to take that one? Yeah. I mean, I just feel like the spectrometer, to me, it could, you know, um, push us toward a, a tipping point more quickly. It could have a real impact. It, it, to me, I could see it shifting the market. It's yeah. like putting, you know, putting power in the hands of consumers and they can go out there and, you know, see exactly what they're paying for. But I do understand, you know, these other concerns being raised here of, you know, if a farmer takes over land that's already degraded and, you know, maybe not knowing what practices or, or even in that process, not getting the benefit. All these things need to be, uh, you know, figured out. But I do think, you know, I don't have a, you know, a clear solution to all of that, but I just do think I really feel a lot of heart for this idea of, you know, being able to actually see the difference. And, you know, sometimes, I mean, when you think about markets, I mean, maybe it's enough, right, that you go out there and we know that this technology exists to know that that food raised in a certain way is healthier, right? And maybe that's enough for consumers. They don't maybe need a spectrometer every time they go to a food yep. store, but they understand, oh, this type of agriculture, this kind of concern about the land does give, you know, great results. And it's interesting because I was thinking about this in preparing for this presentation. Even though there was this tipping point in antibiotic-free meat, the real actual technical understanding from consumers of what's actually happening doesn't even exist today. Like people will think that there's antibiotics in the meat or not. Oh, that's what antibiotic free means. But they don't understand, you know, the connection between, oh, this is bacteria that are actually becoming resistant. And, you know, but the fact is they've got some kind of connection going on in that, in their mind. And that connection was enough to shift the market, right? Even though, it's not accurate. And sometimes it's, you know, just knowing out there with enough talk about a spectrometer that this sort of system produces better quality stuff. Maybe not everyone's going to need, like I said, to measure every single thing that they buy at the store. It's just making that connection in consumers' minds. And I also think that there's something that we can learn just about, you know, farmers' markets, right? In my work before coming to Applegate, I was involved in starting farmers markets in uh, the community where I live. And I would see people come in. They don't, you know, nothing was certified organic. Nothing was, you know, went through all these verification processes. But like they knew the person behind the counter. They saw them every single week and they got to know that person and they just trusted them. There's something that has to do just basically, sometimes I think we overcomplicate things. It's like, these people have good intention and that's good enough sometimes for people to, you know, purchase from somebody. They don't need, you know, somebody coming in, putting a label on something or a stamp or verification. It's just, you know, you go to the farmer's market and you trust the people that are there and you see them every week. Now, how to put, translate that feeling to a label for a nationally a national company is like another story but i've seen firsthand how customer people don't actually need a whole lot of proof that you're doing the right thing they need to be able to trust you yeah which is how i've you know positioned how i i envisioned the meter would actually affect things is 
I've said it, you know, in various points, like you've got <clears throat> three brands of milk on the shelf and you've got um, 50 people around the country who are all able to test those three brands of milk. And if 48 find out that this one is better in their experience <laughs> and they put that out on social media, <clears throat> then you can get that identification in the people's mind with a brand and quality and their children's health. And so I think that there is definitely, and that's, that's the idea here of, you know, working with big companies, if they do actually have a, um, a sort of standards in their supply chain that you can, you can ensure that they actually are going to be getting the results and you don't need to check all the time. No one, it doesn't have to be happening all the time to have that functional effect of the social, um, approval, positive, you know, association, um, would presume greater, greater demand, greater market. So yeah, that's how I see it playing out. But, um, and you guys were talking, you know, a lot at the first sort of half of the presentation about, about regenerative and, you know, framing it all in regenerative. And then sort of at the end, we're, you know, talking about nutrient density. I was actually interested to see how small the number of sales is 21 million. You said last year, or the year before in, national sales of, of regeneratively certified products. That's, you know, <laughs> compared yeah. to 60 billion for organic is really quite nothing. And, you know, targeting 6 billion into 2030, you know, I certainly hope we have a lot more nutrient dense sales than 6 billion in 2030. But how do you guys think that, I mean, and, and, and again, the argument that you're making for the ecological benefit and the, you know, human health and um, farm viability, et cetera, and then that slide where we basically where you you know you had the BFA slide where we talked about all the concomitant benefits of of nutrient density, they're sort of different ways of saying the same thing. How far apart is regenerative and nutrient density from this holistic perspective? How do you guys see the movement, the regenerative movement, and its you know receptivity to and desire to engage nutrient density as a metric that can be measured? What do you guys think about that? Because we're kind of yeah, I think I've said enough. <clears throat> yeah, so my my opinion there is, we, I mean, we mentioned regenerative is the potential is maybe bigger than some other food movements because it touches other industries as well. And nutrient density is probably going to be less important for those industries. And there are there is a ton happening with, you know, certain regenerative practices on farms that, you know, maybe don't even know what the word regenerative means. They might be getting climate smart dollars to implement regenerative practices that will actually have a big impact because, you know, the low hanging fruit of, you know, transitioning some conventional corn and soy farms, one practice might make a huge change environmentally that, um, you know, other industry goals are going to be maybe more rooted in the environmental benefits versus a nutrient dense product. But I mean, I think, you know, from my perspective, the, um, we, we take the stance of like, you are what you eat and, you know, our anim if we eat animals, animals are eating, what are they eating? And if we can, you know, adjust what they eat, um, to be more efficient in their systems and, you know, have them be as healthy as they can be. Um, that's going to result in, you know, just an overall healthier product. So, um, I think I lost the thread of your question, but Gina, Zach, you can chime in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I guess I would just say that because we kind of chatted about that as we were going through this presentation of like, we're talking about regenerative agriculture and nutrient density and like sometimes interchangeably, which is, we know isn't always the case from like what, what you shared, Dan, at the beginning of this conference. But I think like when we're saying regenerative, we're not necessarily saying like a set of practices or a certain certification, but like true, regener true regeneration that would result in true nutrient density. And I kind of see those things as potentially like merging and nutrient density being, at least in the food industry, like the key outcome of like a true regenerative approach. Yeah. How about you, Gina? Any thoughts? Nothing different to add. 
No, yeah. I think, I mean, that's that's how I see it. I mean, <clears throat> and from the graphs I, I shared at the beginning, you know, we had people who claimed regenerative and maybe were doing series, various other practices, but weren't getting the results. And that's was really the point I was trying to make was that, you know, just because you have a label doesn't necessarily get the results. But I think this is part of the, if there's a, it's not a, really a battle or a war, but definitely there's definitely this like ferment, I would say, in the regenerative movement around true regeneration and systemically actually accomplishing it versus checking the boxes. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a bubbling, <laughs> it's a bu bubbling ferment, which is great because I think, you know, the opportunity for the impulse of the movement is to really move the ball forward and it could easily get um, caught on the shoals of what happened to organic with, you know, uh, a binary process definition that was slowly watered down because, effectively industrial control of the certification process or the standards process, you know, had that, had that incentive. So. Uh, yeah. I think that's why we are seeing this shift to an outcome-based approach is the same thing. Like, just like you may not achieve with a certain list of practices, you may not achieve like true nutrient density. You also likely won't achieve kind of true full ecosystem restoration and positive outcomes across not just carbon but like carbon water biodiversity soil health um so i think this shift to a holistic outcome approach which seems to be where at least like the apparel and fashion industry is going um will help ensure i guess that there isn't that watering down and that in order to claim true regeneration you'll have to show holistic regenerative outcomes across all those areas yeah yeah. So um, I, I like I like the points you're making at the beginning. I think Gina about the sort of the Malcolm Gladwell and the and the tipping point and the stories and and things. Where would you see where would you see nutrient density sits right now in that continuum and and what suggestions might you have for the movement going forward about how to um, you know take those insights and implement them. I mean, in I, to me, in terms of nutrient density, I mean, nutrient density is an easier sell. I mean, when you think about that, it's like if you have a way to measure something, you know, that you can put into somebody's hands and they can go, go out and do that themselves. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, less about all this other work that needs to be done. It's like, here's a tool and you can use it to make your own decisions. But I think to Irwin's point about, you know, there's this nuance, you know, what if you're doing the right thing and, you know, you're taking over this degraded land and you're not getting those benefits, but you're doing the right thing and all these sorts of things that can happen. I think that that's why we need, you know, these stories, these better stories. And I think better marketing, way yeah. better marketing, you know, when we're talking about regeneration, I mean, again, the way we ended this with this quote, it's more beauty, more abundance, whatever. Regenerate, regeneration needs to be marketed the way luxury goods are marketed with this beautiful high level of aesthetic, you know, to demonstrate the lack of compromise, right? This is about beauty. This is about aspiration. This is about, you know, a world that we all desire. I mean, how do we make things more desirable? Again, you know, the stories that we have right now are you know, <laughs> depressing, <laughs> you know, you know, don't do this or you're going to, you know, don't do this. Or you're going to die. You know, it's like, it's just like, it's just breeding hopelessness. And, you know, if you think about, you know, luxury brands, you know, people are like, oh, well, that's for the 1%. Well, I beg to differ. If you go to any Louis Vuitton store on the weekend, trust me, the 1% is not in that line that goes out the store oftentimes and, and down the street. These are people purchasing twelve hundred plus dollar purses and spending two months' salary on it. Why? Because they want to be part of this, you know, universe that these brands were able to create through their imagery and through their aesthetic. It's powerful, powerful uh, marketing, you know. And I think that that's, you know, that is really key. How do we start to talk about the beautiful world that regeneration can create. Um, something that really struck me was in a, 
in a presentation that Zach presented about a rubber project that he's very proud of and should be that, you know, is still going on in Thailand where there was, you know, he showed me this slide one time where it was like audio from a conventional farm and from this regenerative farm right next door to it. Yeah. And the cacophony of birds and, and noises that you heard in the regenerative farm, not to mention the beauty, the color and everything versus the, you know, conventional one. And to me, it's like, you don't, you don't even need words for that, right? Who wouldn't want to support that system with the cacophony happening of nature, right? So how do we start to, you know, create these images and, and whatnot? And, you know, as part of public good provisions, something we're really excited about doing is creating regenerative experiences, you know, letting people hear the sound of the soil that, you know, you can hear the life that's in it, you know, and how do we bring that feeling to people, um, which I think is just, you know, that's what I'm obviously I've been rambling now for a couple of months. That's what I'm most no, excited that's about. That's beautiful. You're totally passionate and <clears throat> potentially quite good at it. And you might actually be right also. So, yeah, <laughs> I think, you know, what is it? Uh, Joseph Campbell's, you know, the whole story about myth and we're basically tribal you know, we're tribal species and we we <clears throat> learn stories and and like well, our myths are cultural myths of of history, of of religion, of science or whatever it is. And so, you know, telling the story is gotta be gotta be a you know a piece of this puzzle. But at the very beginning of your your comment, you said you think that nutrient density can be a, a more an easier sell. So mm -hmm. I mean I would agree with yeah. you on the concept of selling a story, but what I mean is it the cacophony or is it the, you know, the, the health of your child, your, your own bodily health, you know, what would be the visceral storylines that you would envision that would be appropriate for nutrient density as a, as a campaign or as a, a way of communicating If that's part of what we're trying to accomplish here. We do the science, figure out the practices, you know, establish meters and metrics and all that kind of stuff. But then, but then building the awareness, um, it's certainly something we've never been particularly good at organizationally with the BFA. I just, I just don't know how I don't, that's not my world. So um, when I meet people like you who actually do have those skills, I'm always very intrigued to listen and <laughs> learn if possible. Yeah. The beauty of nutrient density is the personal benefit is evident, right? It's more nutrient dense, right? Yeah. It's better for you. That justifies things. In these other stories, it's more difficult to connect, like, why should I care about a farmer, you know, engaging in certain practices that improve bird habitats or whatever? It's like, it's there needs to be more zhuzhing to get to make that connection happen. But, you know, if I understand, I mean, the connection between nutrient density and why a consumer would want to purchase it is so direct and clear, it doesn't require all the extra zhuzhing, you know? You don't need, but, you don't need yeah. to be a marker to, 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 to <laughs> right. Right. You need to say, right. like, oh, duh. <laughs> yeah. Right now, consumers are making food choices based on the nutrition label that's there. And so what we're talking about is upgrading that label to actually say more about what's in the food. And so if they can look at that, compare labels, you know, understand that they need more than just protein, carbohydrates, and calories, they will, you know, be able to make choices based on that. And they are making choices based on their personal health. We, you know, the other things are nice to have. Even we found this with animal welfare and antibiotics. I mean, consumers want that, but they don't, you know, that's a nice to have. Um, and, you know, they're not going into details about different animal welfare certifications and what that really means for the animal. They don't care if the animal has, you know, environmental enrichments. They don't know the details of the animal welfare certification, but they see that seal on there and they say, okay, good box checked on that. Um, but, you know, the rest of the decision, the majority of the decision is, what's the best choice for my health and my family's health? They don't, you know, we know like they don't want a ton of sugar for their kids. They don't want 
um, you know, just flat calories that, you know, will give their kids like a sugar rush and be done. You know, they are looking specifically for health and this is what's speaking to that. Yeah. And I think too, like we, like we should never forget when in talking about food, it's about flavor, right? Yeah. And it's, it's my understanding at least that if something is more nutrient dense, it makes sense that it would be more flavorful, right? Exactly. More delicious, yeah. right? Deliciousness when we're talking about food and, you know, the quality softness, whatever, you know, when we're talking about fashion and fiber and wool and all of that. So, you know, and yeah. maybe that is, um, Part of this too, it's like, as Erwin would say, you know, what about these nuances if a farmer is not really there yet, but engaging in all the right practices, doing the right thing. You know, I personally believe that that intention that you're putting in there, even though it's not seen, that consciousness behind it is going to create delicious product and deliciousness is what people care about. Because it's like, it could have all the nutrition in the world. God knows, like, how do we all eat? right? What tastes good? Yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and there's, I mean, this happens at the farmer's market, like most people in the summertime know, if they go to the farmer's market to get their tomatoes, they taste better. And yeah. that's yeah. why they're doing that. They're like, yeah, it's great to buy from a local farmer, but they're not, that's not why they're going. They're going because the tomatoes taste better. Um, and so, you know, it's sort of, I don't have, you know, we don't have data, I, you know, around like consumer choices at the farmer's market, but, um, you know, like people correlate local with more flavor and, you know, that's really the same thing we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. Which in case, in this case probably had more to do with the fact that it was picked ripe than right. That it was local perceps but it really does help if you wait till a tomato's ripe before you pick it <laughs> because yeah you can make it turn pink <laughs> when you picked it, it was green but it's not going to taste like a a papa ripe tomato yeah yep. yeah so it's just the juice here is just is the is the it tastes good and it's good for you and oh by the way beautiful sounds and and storylines as well but it's a very visceral yeah i mean it seems to me that's i it, that's how i've seen it for years it's like there's an octuple bottom line here. There's all these concomitant, you know, benefits. And, but, but if we can, if we can meet people on that visceral self-interest level and have everything else also there, then it's, then it's, then you get them, you know, I like to talk about the um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and people think about themselves before they think about the greater good. That's just the way it is. So if you can meet both, awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. Erwin, did you have another point you wanted to bring up or question? No, I just uh, I really agree on your mass love uh, contemplation of this uh, conversation there. Because that's yeah. just what it is. Yeah. If you can combine the two, that's the best. Yeah. That's how I've seen it, but it's always good to yeah. <laughs> get people's perspective. Uh, because, you know, me and you as a farmer really care about getting the intricate nutrient density or nutrient value good then you know um this conversation is also about bringing that to the people and then you might need to talk about different stuff uh, to sell it to the people um to also bring about this point yeah yeah i think a really good example of this you know back to the electric car and the shift yes all the things carolyn was talking about in terms of the infrastructure but look at what happened between you know a prius and a tesla yeah right Tesla made a sexy car that people want to drive that happens to be electric. They didn't make an electric car, yeah. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> why do people buy cars? It's about image. <laughs> it's about, you know, they wanted to get the people that maybe not even don't even care about electric or not. They may, they want to get the people that like to drive. Yep. Right. That like cars. And that's, you know, again, another shift right we want to and sell that, product on deliciousness but but to one of the points you're making during your presentation you it can't scale until the supply chain function is there right. and so if this is where you need to go to get that supply chain the wheels greased so that we can have this all figured out i mean that is a critical component of the scaling process um yes so it's not necessarily that we're trying to 
appeal to just the 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 you know the rich and famous. It's just a logistical constraint of setting up a different supply chain or modulating the supply chain takes effort, and uh, there's going to be you know people only people are going to do it who can make a premium off of it, and so that's what's necessary. But this is a natural part of the of bringing it to to you know dominant paradigm. Cool. Yeah, we want to be ready for when that demand hits that the you know that the supply is there for that. You have the to have the supply chain in place, otherwise it doesn't matter. Right, exactly. I mean, the time has to be right, as I think Carolyn was saying, but yes, also <laughs> you, have to, you have to have the capacity. So we've got about five minutes left here and what we would have the sort of the, the panel Q&A section before we jump into the, the questions from the audience. Do either of you, any of you have questions you'd like to ask the other or, um, and you guys all work together to some some degree. I think you know each other quite well and, Maybe you would have something you think, you know, <laughs> someone hasn't brought up that would be worth, <laughs> worth worth pointing to, or just if you want to ask each other anything, go for it. I'll go. Uh, so for Zach, you know, this is, you know, we talk about nutrient density, a lot we're talking about food. Um, how do you see the fashion world, you know, adopting this concept of nutrient density and how would that fit into their concept of regenerative agriculture? Yeah, it's interesting because there's not that very direct um, yeah. consumer benefit of obviously like nutrient density and fashion. I think there is starting to be like an understanding around um, how certain dyes can affect people and allergies to dyes and the those chemicals and how they affect your skin. It's probably that that is not mainstream yet and so we're probably a ways off before consumers thinking about okay did like pesticides on the cotton before that cotton was dyed or anything is that also affecting my skin and in my body um so i see that as i i think there probably there probably is something there but i see that as being like a ways off um and so i think in the meantime especially for fashion it, it is about this storytelling i think also that um, people wear clothes to support like a certain a, a lot of people wear clothes to support a certain self-image and if there's the ability to kind of like connect that self-image with caring for the environment and planet I think that that's also something that dr drives demand on the fashion apparel side um, and I also just think that fashion it really it like kind of like Gina said before it does have a unique ability to create desirability for something that maybe you don't need. <laughs> so maybe like there, you don't need regenerative fashion for your health or for whatever. Um, but like fashion can do the storytelling that creates that like cool factor and desirability that I think can make people switch from buying conventional clothes to buying regenerative because it has this really amazing story and marketing and lifestyle attached to it. I think that's really where um, fashion will win. And I think like, it's, it's just interesting to see how it is taking off in fashion in the way that it is without, without that direct consumer benefit. Cause we're, we're like I shared earlier, we're seeing it across like a wide variety of brands. And it went from 2016, like nobody talking about it to like 2020 it being talked about a lot in fashion. And so I think it's it's all those factors that that I mentioned um, coming to play. And I also think just like you were talking about McCain and it being like a life raft for brands, I know that like apparel and fashion is thinking about it in that way as well, because like cotton is such a water intensive crop and there's such issues with drought and water scarcity. And so they also know that it's about supply chain resilience too, just from like a, a brand perspective. Interesting. But there's, I, I mean, I would say there's not really any natural nutrient density connection to, to clothing for, to answer your question directly, Carolyn, I mean, the, the regenerative sort of like you are, what you're wearing had a beneficial impact on the planet is much more of the regenerative sort of mm -hmm. messaging. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I mean, I guess it's possible that the, texture of the hide is or the color of the hide is changed with different nutrients but 
I don't, I mean, I doubt that would be a reason why <laughs> fashion <laughs> companies would buy a hide or not. Right. I think, I think with cotton, the healthier the plant is, the longer the, um, whatever it's called, the fiber length and, and stuff like that and softer and stuff. So I think there are actually some, some experiential benefits that can come from cotton more well-grown, but yeah. Yeah. Zach or Gina, do you, either of you have a question for anybody else here? We can, we can jump to the Q and A from the audience. No. Yeah. Nothing top of mind. All right. If, if something comes up, feel free. All right. Uh, Claire asks, does Applegate have examples of farmers able to diversify into also fruit or vegetable or tillage, et cetera, and making a living alongside animal ag. In Ireland, farmers typically cannot be making a living from also growing vegetables alongside beef farming, meaning huge imports of vegetables still. Any, any comment on that? Uh, yeah, so I, um, if I understand your question correctly, um, you know, part of our, we aren't cataloging everything that happens on, the farms that we purchase from. Um, and so, you know, we don't have data to say, you know, how many total acres they have in their, you know, under their purview and what they're doing with the other acres. Um, but we, you know, we know a lot of our farms also, you also, you know, might be growing grains for feed. A lot of them grow their own grains for, you know, pork and poultry that would eat uh, feed uh, rations. And so a lot of them do do that and they would rotate, you know, their animals through those crop fields and have a rotational system there. Um, but as far as vegetables go, I don't, I don't know offhand if any of our farms are doing that. My guess would be probably not one because of the different, you know, the totally different business model that is um, and the different requirements that it would take um, on the farm itself, but then also just like probably food safety. Um, you know, there's definitely requirements around how close your animals can be to your vegetable fields. Um, and so, you know, I think that we should, we can do more to, you um, you know, look at holistic systems. And that's, I mean, I'm super interested in, you know, Applegate being a brand that can present a model to a large, mid-sized, larger farm and say, here's a system that we know works and maybe it's happening in other countries or maybe it's, um, it, you know, for whatever reason, not well adopted here in the U.S. or the Midwest or, you know, wherever. And we can say, you know, like, let's try this out. Um, and I know other brands, um, Doc Bronner's comes to mind that has done an incredible job of, um, you know, working with their supply chain of palm oil and creating a system that, um, is a rotation. Um, and so what grows well with the palm is cocoa and what was the other crop they were growing? Zach might know, um, and their goal essential oil that they use in their toothpaste or something so they had multiple layers Maybe. of yeah of with or stuff. yeah right and so they're like okay now we build the market for these other things that our farmers are growing because we knew this was the best system um so yeah i i think that's a, an awesome approach and um there's a lot of room for development there cool uh, there's another half, I guess, Claire adds an, another question, which seems like it's fairly similar, but I'll just to add on here. Um, uh, are you working to um, returning parts of farmland to silver pasture or even restoring habitats and farms as part of healthier animals overall, and thus no need for antibiotics? It sounds like mm -hmm. probably yes, it's part of what you were just explaining. Yeah. So, I mean, when we, because we are sourcing from larger farms and we're not on all of the farms that we are sourcing from all the time and we can't really see it all. We do rely on third party certifications um, to do that, knowing that it's not a it doesn't mean it's a perfect system if it's third party certified, but it is a way for us to ensure certain criteria are met. And so 
Um, you know, most we would be we're selective about the regenerative third party programs that we would use on farms. And that would be, you know, part of the continuous improvement plan on the farm. And there would be, um, you know, a restoration of um, of land at risk or waterways, um, you know, a, a, there would be agroforestry implemented into um, their, you know, their system. So, you know, through that regenerative certification and the, the programs, um, I would say that's going to be pretty widely considered as part of their total farm improvement plan. Cool. I see one from Dina here that I think maybe is good for, for Gina and Zach about public good provisions. Um, it says the public have been observing the rise of food costs in general, especially since the pandemic. For the beautiful vision, we would like for consumers to afford groceries and for the farmers to be paid fairly and to be protected from risk. This, there seems to be a funding gap. Um, I think you guys have been talking about <clears throat> working in coalitions of, of producers to maybe have shorter supply chains and and have the farmers developing their own brands. And do you want to share anything about what you've been doing? Because it, it sounds fairly inspiring. Um, and I, I, I think it's inspiring, but I don't think you've talked about it. And it might help address this this question. Yeah, so, so the buying coalition is a way for us to um, ensure that there's a lot of collaboration going on and that we are being efficient so that we are, in the case of animal agriculture, using every single solitary part of the animal, right? So bringing together a meat company, somebody that uses trim, you know, a cosmetic company, a fashion brand, pet food company, all the necessary companies that it would take to utilize every part of an animal and every part of a farm system. Because when you do that, that's what we mean by, you know, creating efficient supply chains. We don't want to pass on inefficiency, like not having all the parts of the animal sold, you know, onto the consumer. Because if you don't have all the parts of the animal or the farm system sold, then you have to mark up excessively the product that you are selling, right? So we're trying to eliminate that by bringing as many people around the table as possible. And, you know... The other thing that that does for the farmer is create security. So, you know, when you think about supply chains being linear, right? A chain, if one link in a chain breaks, the whole system collapses. Where if you can surround a farm network with numerous purchasers, if any one of those drops out, you know, the, the integrity of the system is maintained. You're creating a supply web one thread that comes out of the web, you still have a web intact, right? So building that resilience, you know, in the systems that we create for supporting farmers so that we ensure uh, resilience and efficiency so that again, we're not passing along unnecessary costs. Yeah, yeah. I, I could just add like another example to that. So there was a project that um, we worked on at Timberland where um, it was a large group of sugarcane producers in Brazil and the sugar that they were producing, the edible portion was going to brands like Hershey's and Pepsi. And then the non-edible portion um, kind of through innovation could be used as a additive into um foot soles so it can actually replace fossil fuels as a bio additive and foot soles on shoes and so if just one of those companies was paying for those farmers to transition to regenerative their one material is going to be really expensive that's going to be like super expensive sugar but if you get these other companies that are also using the other parts of the plant to come in and collaborate and cost share you can actually get cheaper sugar and the same result and so there's lots of examples of that, just like with leather and beef or um, other crops grown together, where um, when it's just one crop kind of bearing the burden of um, transitioning that supply chain and getting a price premium, it's really expensive. But when multiple kind of crops can be valued for being regenerative, then that cost can be shared. Cool. Um, Sue, Sue asked a question. Um, Question to everyone, if you walked into a supermarket tomorrow to pick up a non-packed lettuce 
And at the lettuce stall, there were three similar types of lettuce, same size, same color, et cetera. But each had a, a peg with a label indicating bricks. And there was a two, five, and 15 bricks. Which would you buy? Um, well, you know what bricks means. You'd buy the 15, I think, is the answer. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I, I think part of that is you, Sue, are in Africa and you are working on a, um, a, it sounds like a piece of software. Hopefully we'll talk to you about it, I think, tomorrow, um, where people can actually um, take BRICS readings and upload them into the cloud and share them um, as part of a a preliminary process of training people to understand that there's variation in the supply chain um, using BRICS now as a stand-in for nutrient density, which I'm very happy to um, say thank you for for creating and and look forward to helping to roll out in partnership to whatever degree we can. But um, that's a very exciting upcoming piece of the puzzle. But Either any of you guys have a have a, a response to that question? I, would just I say that, go ahead, Zach. I was going to say that that's super exciting to hear that that's happening, and I think that also highlights like the opportunity of brand marketing because a lot of people off the streets are not going to know is lower or higher bricks better? Is it yeah. like a golf score or something else? And so mm -hmm. I think there's a big opportunity for brands and their marketing to really show consumers like what that is and why that matters. Yeah. I totally, I totally agree. I, I uh, used to grow sorghum cane on my, to get the syrup. So we would press syrup and use the bricks meter for sugar content uh, testing. And I just like, that's great because, you know, farmers are already familiar with, you know, bricks and measuring that. And so, I feel like that'd be a good a good way to uh, communicate the the message pretty quickly. Yeah, I think I mean for me, if if the part of the process now is telling the story and the campaign and and raising awareness, um, you know, until we have meters out there that are flash of light, ex, you know, exciting ones, the refractometer is still a pretty damn good one, um, and and having a electronic framework where people can begin to do that, test the get results, you know, put them out in the web. Like I said before, with the three samples of milk, if you had 48 people saying this company's milk is better than those companies' milk, if you had <laughs> people doing it with carrots and refractometers, um, we could begin to get that that momentum bubbling up from the bottom and and helping to differentiate. I think that's maybe one of the points of differentiation between how I envision nutrient density and regenerative and other sorts of ways that things are being looked at is that, you know, what we're proposing is a continuum standard. So it's not like you have to per se get the supply chain up to a certain level before you can talk about it. The fact is everything sits somewhere in the continuum now and you can go out and you can see where things stand. And so it's just about that sort of feedback loop perhaps being stimulated by saying, this is, <laughs> this is the quality of your meat right now. This is and this is this is these are, these are your options on on the on the on the shelf, so um, <clears throat> yeah, cool. Um, okay, Mandy oh, says that. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go no, ahead, go for it. I was just going to read well, another I, question. I was just going to say I just saw um, a a comment from Dina Rosen coming up on the chat about the farming. You know, farmers and farming lifestyle needs a makeover. And I'm just excited about it because I say this all the time. Yes to that. It's like, I, you know, I was on the board of the National Young Farmers Coalition. And I remember going to their first conference, the convergence that they do every year. And I never in my life saw so many young, gorgeous, model looking, healthy people in my life. And I was like, this is a marketer's dream. These people are stunning. And yet, like, why are they not the face of farming? You know, these young, beautiful, healthy people, you know, choosing this lifestyle of farming that's actually cool. And, you know, I'm my own boss. And, you know, this whole sort of, you know, ethos and idea that, that I think people would eat it up. And yet we're still, you know, putting out there this very old version of a farmer, you know, in overalls, you know, with a piece of wheat between his teeth when we've got this like marketing gold. So, yeah, I believe totally 
we need to make everything more sexy. Farming, food, <laughs> all of it. <laughs> it is totally true when you go to a farming conference, at least the kind of farming conferences I go to, that the people are much more attractive than they are in the airport <laughs> or <laughs> and the uh, no hotel or anywhere, anywhere else. It really is like, wow, yeah. that's a lot of <laughs> Where'd all the beautiful people My come God. from? It's so true. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> nice <clears throat> all right um um I, I can keep reading the questions here but people should feel free to um speak up if they saw a question or a, a, a comment in the chat they want to want to want to refer to i don't need to be the only one responding here um, yeah I, I can just jump in um on mandy's question or, or comment around the shift to or shift away from plastic clothes i do see that as a, a major trend that is happening and is going to happen um i think that we need to be like careful with it because there's the there can be the perception that um as long as it's natural it, it's it's fine so shifting away from polyester nylon plastics to cotton or wool is all we need to do. And I think that's where we have an opportunity to really like communicate that actually like cotton and wool can be grown in, in really degrading, damaging ways as well. Um, so it's not enough just to make that switch, but to do it regeneratively is is where there's going to be a big benefit. So um, yeah, thanks for bringing up that point. Cool. And, and Doug has a question there about regenerative hides, harder. Um, yeah. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. There's not a very clear answer. So the, this was something I was very deep in on at Timberland. And from what we had seen so far, um, there's kind of like trade-offs. There's basically when you have um, regeneratively grown hides, you sometimes may see less stretch marks on the hide. Um, but on the flip side, you are getting a lot more scratches and insect bites because the animals are on grass for their entire life rather than in a feedlot so there's just more opportunity for their skin to have those aesthetic differences or damages which when you're kind of like cutting out leather for a shoe you have to cut around like a scratch or, or tick mark um some things have to be cut around because it would be like um it would be a true defect some things are only cut around because consumers are used to very consistent aesthetic. So I think there is the opportunity for brands with the right storytelling to actually cut those defects or um, aesthetic differences into the shoe and use that as like a storytelling tool. Like, yes, every shoe looks different. There's natural variation because this animal was out on grass its entire life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so right now, I would say in the industry, it's actually viewed as a negative that the, the hides are poor quality based on how the industry judges quality today. But I think that could shift with the right storytelling. That's very interesting. And, and I also want to ask you, like from a food perspective, the inconsistency or like, how do we make uh, div diversity or, you know, inconsistency desirable like we see this with terroir like and the idea of talking more about the terroir of food where oh why does this cheese or or these blueberries or this meat taste different you know in this region versus another based on what that animal is eating or how you know the climate was in that particular region so i think that there's like a whole new level of storytelling and i really am excited about the idea of doing that around meat you know, how do we talk about the nuances and the differences and the terroir? You know, we see it in cheese, obviously, in wine. And similarly with fashion, you know, how to incorporate, like we're walking around with like jeans with holes all over them. So like, how do we translate that to leather? And like, you know, how do we make a stretch mark Please let me know if that ever happens, that we can make a stretch mark <laughs> desirable and acceptable and, and you know, maybe beautiful. <laughs> it's a great point. It's a great point. And I think there's a, I mean, there's the whole thing about industrial food, right? Was really looking for, for things to be extraordinarily uniform. 
And that is exactly the model of the system is everything has to taste the same every time. And it's better if it doesn't have any flavor and we can put synthetic flavorings into it than if it actually has unique flavor depending on the season, depending on where it was produced. Yeah, exactly. There's a, it's a whole shift. That's an interesting struggle. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We, you got Applegate, Applegate's perspective. I mean, I just really like, because yeah. it is something that you want to do is you want things to be uniform, right? Well, that's the whole uh, supply piece of the ecosystem that needs to shift. And that's a huge thing. I mean, the food system is designed with very particular containers and machines that fit very specific sizes of things. And when we, you know, start adjusting that, it becomes less efficient inherently. The, the trucks become less full because the boxes are less full. The, you know, consumer has to like sift through, uh, you know, like different size pork chops to get to the, the four that match for their dinner that night. And, you know, consumers aren't ready for that. And not only consumers, but it's just not, it's like the system is not set up to accommodate that very easily. Um, we have, you know, tomatoes are a good example of, um, you know, just the, the farms up and down the East coast that are growing tomatoes, you know, their, their heart, their entire season is harvested in two, two weeks. And, um, that is like whatever isn't usable. I mean, they leave with millions of pounds of tomatoes that can't be sold because they have a blemish on them. They can't even be counted as like seconds, you know? And so it's just this whole system of buying perfection and fitting things into containers, um, that's a big change. And that definitely is a big part of this, this equation. Um, like, and it's more maybe about how do we think about efficiency? Like, what are we incentivizing in the food system? Um, and it's, it's just, you know, shifting like the whole concept of um, what efficient means or, you know, whatever. So, uh, you know, I don't know, it's a tough one because it would be challenging to go from this idea that everything's uniform to all over the map, um, with meat production, especially it'd be tough. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, <clears throat> things never used to be uniform, but, but then we didn't all used to live in cities and, and, you know, have jobs and buy food in stores and you know, supermarkets mm -hmm. at least. Um, so, we we were able to do it at one point in time, but but we are where we are now. And mm -hmm. like I don't think most people are going to go back to farming in the next two years or five years. They're probably mostly going to keep buying most of their food in grocery stores. So, you know, if we want to be thoughtfully integrating all these dynamics, you know, mm -hmm. working with the industrial supply chain is probably a good idea. Um, and then, yeah, <laughs> there's all these unforeseen unforeseen struggles that 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 uh, come up. Yeah. Anyway, um, I remember I, I used to have a contract with Whole Foods for tomatoes and um, they were, I was one of their farmers. They would put up a, a picture of me and did all this massive marketing. It was like, oh, we buy from a local farmer. And like, but um, every tomato was a different color, different shape. And <laughs> every every 15 pound box, you couldn't find two tomatoes that looked the same. And that was, yeah. that was my look. That was the marketing. It was, it was not uniform. It was, and I like to have my carrots that way and my beets that way and things too, you know? So yeah, it's maybe it's possible for non-uniformity to be a uniform perspective, but yeah. yeah. Asking a lot. Yeah. I mean, and when you think about like meat production, small scale meat production on a farm, like so poultry, you know, pastured poultry is one of like the easiest ways for be you know beginning or small farmers to you know the easiest things to grow it doesn't take much upfront cost to you know create you build some pens um pasture you know they're a quick turnaround um but then you get to the processing step 
and the processing plant costs millions of dollars. And if that thing isn't operating all the time, year round, the costs are just, it makes it a completely unsustainable business model. And so pastured poultry, it's like maybe six months out of the year, you have a crop and then the rest of the time there's nothing. So what's happening in the processing plant? And that processing plant is all the shackles are the same size. Like everything is the same size to accommodate certain size chickens or turkeys or whatever it is. And so um, the amount of things that are accommodating a uniform size and season out and like a, you know, consistent supply, it's just, it, it may, it's kind of depressing to think about because it's like, wow, man, we got a lot of work to do to change this. Either you're going to go back, have to go back to making your own ham and making your own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> everything. Or if you want to buy it from the store, you have to deal with the fact that for it to get into the store, it's going to have to have gone through a process like this. Yeah. But be, honest, be honest about this is what, this is what the system is. And this is part of what you're taking part of part in yeah. every day. So yeah, yeah. I know tendencies are nice, but yeah. Yeah. Cool. We got a couple minutes left. Um, and I think I've got a couple maybe sh short questions here um, at the beginning. Um, what approaches does Applegate have to reduce methane emissions from cows and the farmers they work with? In the EU, this is a huge focus on the directives for all EU member states. Yeah, methane. Yeah. Um, it's a tough one because we are, Applegate does all grass fed. We know that grass fed cows emit more methane because they are um, eating grass, which is going to naturally ferment differently in their stomachs and produce more methane that way. And then they're living longer. Um, and so that, you know, is to me, I think this topic is kind of a distraction from what we're all trying to accomplish, even though we have to address it since we're getting regulations around this topic. And I don't, I'm not as familiar with what's going on in the EU to know kind of like how they're messaging this, that in a way that's not perpetuating the factory farm model, right? So we're, you know, we're trying to build a system that mimics nature. Um, we're trying to message uh, that people should be eating better meat. It is factual that grass-fed beef is more nutritious than grain-fed. Um, and then we're trying not to promote this corn-soy system that is, um, you know, like inundating our food supply across the board. And so, um, you know, I just can't see a world where a we would make a choice to raise something in a factory farm setting just to reduce the methane. There's so many other factors that um, aren't addressed in that in that narrow question that not your question, but just like the concept. The, view of, the yeah, concept. Yeah. yeah that um, it just is an unfortunate thing that everybody's latched onto. Um, but I, I understand like the impacts of methane to the environment and climate. Um, and so that's why I'm like, how do we, you know, really work to capture, properly capture the data of like a more biodiverse ecosystem, you know, the healthier soil, any carbon that's sequestered on the land, legitimately water quality, human health. I mean, like, can we like look at the human health of the labor on the, yeah, it's just like the whole gamut and like, yeah, I could, go on but um yeah i i would love to talk more uh but um it's a tough one well i think when i was out there for that event you hosted in minneapolis earlier this year there were some people there who i think you've been working with that have been looking at lcas and and how we do full cost accounting and i think it's a bit of a red herring um this 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 um methane point and cows um there's a lot of science which says you know, <laughs> if you look at the systemic benefits, there's a lot of like overarching, like the, the weight of the of the scale is much more positive over here. You can find one thing, but even, you know, there's methanotrophs in the in the in a in a pasture that'll breathe in that burped yeah. you know, methane and and 
turn it into fertilizer for the plants in real time. It doesn't actually get into the atmosphere. It only gets right. into the atmosphere when you're in a when you're in a CAFO and all the manures in a big lagoon. Um, there's all kinds of I think hard science around that. But again, <clears throat> you know, dealing with a global system and having these storylines going out there, um, where you may actually have we'll just say economic interests who are opposed to meat production mm -hmm. or, or or whatever. And so and so how do you how do you factor the, what this how the science works there? So um yeah. I, it's, uh, yes. looking forward to following up on that LCA conversation. Life cycle yeah. analysis. There's yeah. a big unlock there for sure. More yeah. LCAs are needed. Yeah. If we're talking about these sort of things on scale with governmental level assessments, you know, the question is what numbers is the government plugging in? And it's called life cycle analysis. And if they're done with a certain set of assumptions, then you'll get a certain set of results. But if you look at other data, you get different results. And so you know, doing that hard work behind the scenes and who's funding it and who's facilitating it. It's actually real work and it's, it, it takes money. And um, yeah, and I think Applegate, you're behind a lot of really wonderful things. I don't think I mentioned, you know, your donation to the Beef Project. You were the largest donor, I mean, of a, as far as a company, you straight up donation, just like here, support this work. So really appreciate all the things you've been doing for now and and in previous previous time to support the movement. Not all companies do that. So, well, we appreciate all the work you're doing. I mean, this is hugely beneficial to society. So, um, happy to support. Yeah, great. We've used up our two hours. It's been a very, um, it feels like it was a very calm conversation, but I think we've gotten into a lot of, a lot of, uh, <laughs> important topics. There's uh, no yelling. No, I was surprised with, especially with Gina in the room. It usually gets pretty loud, <laughs> but I guess she's but I'm totally good behavior. Wow. She's the tone is like, I'm going to be polite today. They were like, okay, Gina's being polite. Well, all are supposed to be polite too. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Any, uh, any, any, any parting words any of you have before we, we say goodbye? Just thank you for oh, no, awesome. mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's just exciting to be a part of this conversation, Dan. I feel like on the very first session of this conference, you laid out such a exciting kind of plan for how this nutrient density um, work is going to evolve and shift the whole market. And I really do believe that's going to happen. And I'm just yeah excited that we had the opportunity to help participate in it. Cool. Well, you're totally part agree. Of the Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. And to the okay. engaged uh, folks in the chat and the great questions and comments. Yep. All right. Wonderful. Well, we'll see everyone here next week with Tim LaSalle. It'll be a great, oh. great conversation, an elder in the movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, Thanks so much. Have a great yeah. day, everyone. Bye. Bye.